Hello and welcome back to the Yoga Life channel. Thanks for coming back and joining us again. And today we're going to discuss a topic that is really relevant in all of our lives. How to create more love in your life and how to create more loving reciprocations with the people around you, whether that's your partners in a romantic relationship, your children, your friends, or in your workplace. Because really, when we are able to give love abundantly and be kind and affirming to others, it always flows back to us and we are able to uplift the environment around us rather than bringing it down. The topic I have for you, I have gathered from one of my favorite books ever, relationship books, which is called The Queen's Code by an author called Alison Armstrong. And there's one specific quote that always keeps sticking to my mind. It is, women ask for too little and demand too much. And this, I remember when I read this for the first time, it really registered and I was mind blown by how much I would have probably done this in my marriage that ended, that um, I'm divorced, um, and how little this would have um, supported me in demanding, 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 and supported a positive relationship with my husband, rather than asking openly and kindly for what it is that I needed. So I wanted to explore this with you more because it's also something that comes up quite frequently with my client. And the question is always, what can I do to make him love me? I'm doing so much and I keep giving and I keep doing and he just doesn't love me back in the way um, that I need to. And we see this with our children as well, as well. The older they get, we are doing for them, we're expecting them to do their chores, for example, there's nagging, there's complaining. So how can we kick off the positive re reciprocation um, and let go of the expectation and the hurt that happens when they are not met? So first of all, what the whole problem is based on is basically um, a sense of the illusion of, I guess, even that um, we are earning love by the deeds that we do. We are earning love and we are deserving love because of something that it is that we are do doing. And the whole assumption in deserving love in return for something takes love away from the unconditional element that it is that we really all want and makes it into some sort of a transaction. It's kind of like if I work for eight hours for my boss, I deserve being paid. If I um, buy something in a shop, the owner of the shop deserves to get money from me. Um, if I um, give so and so much um, in a volunteer scenario, I hopefully will be honored in return. And we do that all the time with people and it's not necessarily always a problem. I know that, for example, if I know I've done something for people frequently that I can rely on that most likely they're going to come back and support me in return when I needed to. However, the difficulty here is when do we start to have expectations, especially unverbalized, unvoiced, um, silent expectations? And when um, are we just open to receive ingratitude and are really joyous when somebody gives to us? There's a big difference there. And you've probably noticed that when you have been doing, doing, doing for someone and nothing much comes back, that there is hurt and anger eventually and it builds up, especially if we are not sharing how we are feeling and what we would like to see happen in return. And it can, can become this whole downward spiral, almost like a victim mentality of, I have done all these things for you um, and you are never doing anything for me in return. And once you are in a spiral like this and in a relationship like this, what happens is when you start demanding things from your partner, like demanding that they do certain things, demanding that they're treating you a certain way, then even if they do, it doesn't feel right anymore. Have you ever experienced this? Even if they are then reluctantly, say, fixing the car or reluctantly doing their chores or reluctantly um, spending an evening out with you um, because you've been nagging them into it, not only doesn't it really feel like they have given it freely, it often also has this negative undertone and that's just not really what we wanted in the first place, so it's not really as rewarding. So what is it that we can do in order to be able to let go of expectations and of hurt and kick off positive reciprocation with the people that we love, with the people that we like, that we care about? Number one is assume that the other person is our teammate in this, especially in romantic relationship. Make an assumption that they are actually on our two team and want the best for us as well. 
once a negative spiral has been created, it can feel like we're almost opponents in this game. And when we are feeling we have given so much and we have received so little in return, we can start clamming up and holding back and stop the flow of love and stop the flow of giving. So instead what we need to do is keep giving, stay open, stay reciprocative, but communicate openly what it is that we want and what we need. And there is a big difference in the way we communicate. When we are already in the state of hurt and anger and disappointment, we will nag the other person. We will keep mentioning to them everything that they haven't done, everything that they should be doing. And all this shooting all over someone is definitely not something that makes them more open and willing and happy to do something for us. So what we can do is make a kind and friendly request of them and absolutely important, do it at a time when we're also being heard, when they are in the middle of doing something or focusing on something else. Particularly men are very single-minded and very single-mindedly focused on their work, on their activities. If we are chiming in from the side, I have that problem sometimes with my teenage son, they don't hear us and it feels like they're being rude, but the truth is that actually don't register what we are saying. So wait for a moment when you're actually in a focused conversation, be it over dinner time, be it when you're actually asking them, hey, do you have five minutes for me? And they say, well, yes, let me finish this and I have time for you later. So once you are actually in a focused conversation and your words are reaching through, then make a kind request. A way that Alison Armstrong in her book Queen's Code proposes is that we are not only sharing what it is that we would like them to do or what it is that we need from them, <coughs> but also share what this would give us, what this would provide for us. So not just say, can you please um, clean up um, the mess that's outside, but say, when you are doing this, it makes me feel like you really take care of me. It makes me feel um, like I'm living in a beautiful place and that you are on my team and supporting me rather than me being a maid that has to do everything here. So make really clear that they don't only know what it is that you want, but also what the purpose is. Because what she says in her book is that men often play for points, meaning that when they can see that they can make you happy and it adds to your happiness and to your joy and really gives something to you, they're much more inclined to do it if they love you, if they care about you, than um, just doing another short chore, especially when it's stuff that is out of their focus and it's just kind of happening around. So very important, share with them specifically what it is that you want and that you need. Another book that's really helpful and that I'm going to do a separate video on is The Five Love Languages by a gentleman called Gary Chapman. This is another way of supporting our spouse, assuming that they are on our team, to love us in the right way, to love us well, and also for us ourselves to learn how to love them well by being able to exactly tune into what it is that makes them feel loved. Because we might, for example, be doing all the cooking and the cleaning, assuming that this is going to make them happy, but what they need is physical affection or personal quality time with them, like focused conversation. So if we are doing one thing, but it doesn't register for them as an act of love and affection, just as another chore that gets ticked off the list, then it doesn't really come through as a loving act. So this is another thing. And in assuming that we are on the same team and wanting to build a beautiful relationship together, we can then from that point of view, see ourselves as educators of our partner, of our spouse, and also of the people around us on how to love us well and how to make us happy. Obviously then, we should also be in a situation where we are then really noticing all the things that are being done for us and we are expressing our, um, our gratitude and our joy and that we are noticing what is being done for us because that can also be like one of the negative sides is that we are taking for granted what is given like if somebody for example cleans our car every weekend does all the washing and the laundry for us does all the chores around the house etc it might be their way of expressing their love for us but if this is not our love language it might not be registered with us so start also noticing what it is that your partner might be doing for you that you might not even be aware of. An interesting example that Alison Armstrong gives in her book is that um, 
the young lady who's one of the two protagonists um, is annoyed every day at her partner for always leaving the garage door open and she one day really frustrated expresses that with him um, and is very surprised to hear that for him the garage door was closed all the time but knowing that she will be home in five minutes he would always open the garage door to make sure that she can drive in without interruption so for him that was actually an act of love and kindness whereas for her she was thinking that he was just being messy and not um, in an orderly fashion closing the garage door behind himself so often it can be these little misunderstandings that make our lives so much harder than it, they really have to be so Explore with curiosity what it is that your partner needs and how you can meet their need for love. And in the same way, look inside and explore what it is that you really desire, that you really need, and make sure to support your partner in being able to give that to you, not through nagging, not through negativity, but through a way of uplifting their spirit by sharing with them, assuming that they want to love you well. And these can be beautiful conversations you can have, by the way, um, say by the fire in the evening or over dinner or on a date. Just share with each other, how do you know that I love you? What are the things that, we used, that I used to do when we were dating that made you really happy and feel appreciate, um, appreciated? What are things that you wish I would do for you? What would your ideal partner do for you? And then be able to share also from your own perspective. One last thought I have is an entirely different angle on this whole topic, which comes from the spiritual tradition that I follow, which is Bhakti Yoga. It's the yoga of love and service. Yoga in the ancient Sanskrit language means to link, to connect, to unite. And it's about connecting to your higher self and connecting ultimately to the divine in whichever way you perceive that to be. If you believe in God, Allah, Yehovah, Yahweh, Krishna, whatever is, is the word that you have. So linking to your higher self and to the best in you and then ultimately uniting with divinity. The idea that Bhakti Yoga has about giving and receiving love is to focus not so much on externals as in I'm doing something for you therefore I deserve but it's tapping into love as something that we are innately. So bhakti means the union of love and of service. So serving and giving from a place of just expressing the love that sits inside ourselves. So not making it a thing that we're doing for someone else or that we should be doing in order for, to receive something, but remember that in our very essence, in our soul, we are love. That there is some eternal spark that expresses through being loving in the world and therefore love not just being a romantic concept or something that um, that we want to experience and receive a feeling but being a verb being a thing that we are doing and therefore infusing all our actions whether this is giving a talk um, on a video or whether it's cooking a meal whether it's dealing with our partners, whether it is dealing with customers and clients that we have um, at our work and our business, infusing every last thing that we do and kind of consciously keeping coming back to the idea of giving love and injecting love in all of our actions because it is an expression of who we are. The beauty in this, other than obviously being a beautiful spiritual practice, is that it takes away the notion that we need another person that will then choose to receive or choose not to receive our love, but that we are completely self-sustained in our expressing love and basically we are the source of love rather than needing someone else to be a reciprocal source, source for us, if that makes sense. So we are shining our light into the world completely regardless of what everybody else will think. And there might be people who are loving to receive this and there might be people who are thinking we are being weird or we are being funny or just not caring about it really. But it doesn't matter because it is who we are. I am love. I'm not doing things to receive love. I am love and therefore it is natural for me to keep the flow going in every area of our lives. So think about that. Maybe that is an interesting little thought experiment for you. And if you desire, maybe make a list of how can you be love, not only in your relationships, but in your day-to-day -day dealings. What are things that you can do, for example, 
being appreciative of the food that you have on the table, being kind to your neighbor, looking after a stray cat that walks into your backyard, um, smiling at strangers in the street, all these little things. How can you be love on a day-to-day -day basis? Because the truth is, the more you are kicking off positive interactions, the more you are radiating love out, the more you are basically tuning into the radio frequency that is love. You are not only sending on that frequency, but you're also receiving back on that same frequency. And that, after all, is what we all truly want, living in love. So I hope this was interesting and fascinating for you. I definitely have a great time exploring this topic in more and more deeper ways. Um, as I said, I'm um, going to share another video shortly about the five love languages because that's a topic that I find really interesting as well. Um, and I hope you've gotten a lot of value out of today. As always, leave your thoughts and your ideas and maybe your positive um, comments down in the comments section. Maybe share your own experiences of how you've been able to give and receive love and how you've been able to come back from a negative spiral, hopefully to a positive one. And as always, you can follow our channel if you like um, and um, subscribe to our updates by clicking the bell button. Have a lovely day and see you again soon.